Um, what, what did it want to do? Okay, all right, it's working. Uh, well, hi, everyone. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and this is your virtual star party for July 7th, 2013, the uh, three days after Independence Day edition, I guess. Um, so uh, tonight, we are going to hook up a bunch of telescopes, and by a bunch, I mean two, uh, into a live Google Plus Hangout and uh, show you some stuff that's happening in the night sky right now. Uh, lots of bad weather and lots of uh, sort of busy summer plans for a lot of our people. So, so it's just going to be just us tonight. Um, so joining us this week, I'm going to sort of start with the telescopes. We've got Gary Ganella, who's in uh, Los Angeles. And we've got uh, Stuart Foreman, who's in the San Francisco area. So West Coast. And, uh, Stuart Hi, everybody. Is, Stuart, is, Stuart is showing us this, uh, this globular star cluster right now. Uh, and then joining us for sort of additional brain power, we've got uh, Dr. Thad Zabo. Good evening. And we've got uh, Corey Schmitz, who is uh, got bad weather, but was going to share some crazy images and regale us with some some stories that he uh, he just captured a bunch of images. So, all right. So let's just start with this image that we're looking at right now. Uh, Stuart, what what are we seeing? Uh, this is M13. It's the great cluster in Hercules. This is a 60-second exposure at um, uh, ISO 800 with a Canon XSI um, camera. And um, uh, this is non-cropped, um, slightly stretched in noise reduction, but this is sort of as you see it uh, in the camera. So, oh, go ahead. Okay, yeah. So, I mean, Globular clusters are essentially left over from when the galaxy formed, meaning that the stars that are in there are about 13 billion years old. Um, this is the second largest one that's visible to us with uh, the company's our own galaxy, and the, the largest one easily visible from the, the northern hemisphere. And uh, if you look at kind of SETI activities, um, there was a signal that was sent at this globular cluster as uh, from the Arecibo radio dish um, in the, the attempt to say, to, you know, to try and make contact. And I'm not sure that was the wisest target because it's very unlikely that there's any life there, but, um, but that's where, that's where they sent it. So they, they tried to send a communications out to, to try and, uh, and make contact with folks in the, in the cluster. Yeah. yeah there was, um, right. They, they, you know, they, you know, kind of, um, Fired a burst, and I forget what exactly was was in the message. I mean, we could you know possibly ask Sandy, I guess, uh, <laughs> right? Hangout, but um, weekly space hangout. But um, yeah, I mean, essentially, a globular cluster isn't really the the place you want to do that, though. The stars are old, and they don't tend to be very metal rich. And one thing that we know is necessary for at least life here on Earth is having this abundance of elements heavier than helium. If you have a bunch of old stars, like in a, a globular cluster, it's going to be mostly just hydrogen and helium that, that make up the stars. Now, as, you know, some of them die, it could possibly create some carbon and oxygen, but you won't have quite the, the rich array of, uh, of elements that are, would be typical in, say, the, the part of the galaxy where our, our sun resides. Um, so just to let people know, you can comment, you can talk to us, as it were. Uh, you can uh, make any requests if you want. If you know some objects that are up in the night sky, I'll be, you know, um, usually we have some new objects that we never even occurred to us to look at when uh, when people make requests. So it's awesome. Uh, so the ways that you can do that, you can make a comment over on the event page if you're watching this on Google Plus, or in my stream if you're watching this that way, or you can make a comment over on YouTube. Um, you can also use Twitter, although it doesn't seem to be working very well. So I, the safest place we always say is over on YouTube. So if you're watching this, you know anywhere, just click on it to watch it on YouTube, and then you can uh, you can make your comment there. Um, yeah. So so I'm going to move on to the object that Gary is showing now. Chris, can you hear us? No, this is Chris. Chris is going to join us. He's got his telescope too, and uh, but he's having some technical problems. So. So we'll see if he's able to hear us. Uh, and if not, then he will watch us. So, <laughs> Gary, what have we got? We have M16, the Eagle Nebula. And this is a 60-second exposure with no binning. So I can... Uh... You know what we want to see, Gary? Like, just just make it happen. 
You want to see the pillars of creation. <laughs> we do. And this is uh, 60 seconds. And there it is right there. Nice. That's the famous Hubble part. And there's the whole picture. So that's right in this area here. Looks about the same, I think. Is Hubble? Yeah. 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 It's about the same <laughs> as Hubble. A it's little got, better, I think. Mine's got better color. Yeah. But I might be remembering it wrong. Yeah, you never yeah. know. <laughs> but but I always right wonder, now. like, what, like, the, the, the pillars are such a strange shape. They look like a rocket kind of blasting off through this this nebula. What's what's really going on there, Thad? Well, I mean, any any time that you have material that's kind of collapsing under gravity, you also have a uh, uh, you know shock waves that have gone through here repeatedly from um, from nearby supernova. Uh, supernovae going off. So, you know, the shape, you, you, if you look across most nebulae, you're going to see some kind of twisted forms in here. Um, the pillars, again, if you look closely, for instance, at the, the Hubble pictures, you can see inside, the, like you'll see a pillar and then you'll see a little protuberance off of one side of it. At the end of that protuberance is where a, a star is forming. Um, and uh, once the star, once fusion kicks in, it kind of is able to shed that dust away then. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you know, the variety of possible initial conditions in a star forming region like this, you, know, you can get all kinds of, of weird shapes going on. So, um, yeah, to try, and, to try and rewind time and figure out, well, how exactly did it get this shape? That's an extremely difficult problem to, to try to... Uh, to try to do computationally, um, and especially from observations, because essentially, I mean, it's very hard to get any kind of 3D feel here. It's, you get some, you get the idea, okay, well, there's this dark gas standing out against this bright background. So, I mean, it's a little bit of a, of a 3D feel, but I mean, any, anything that you do in space where you're trying to, you know, image something and also get a feel for the distance is, is very difficult to do. So yeah, trying to rewind, okay, well, how did it end up looking this way instead of like a smiley face or whatever else? Um, you know that's 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 a non-trivial, almost a, a not a not possible problem at this point. So now I'm hearing some reports, and I, I'm actually sort of able to confirm this. Uh, I guess I'll have to click on me for a second here. That that nobody is able to see the film strip at the bottom of the presentation. So we're just seeing whatever is the thing that I'm clicking on, and we're not actually seeing the the various objects, which is, I don't know if people are watching this. Is anyone seeing anything different? That's really strange. So I'm watching it, and there's no film strip on there. It yeah, is. okay, all right. Well, I'm going to have to it, tell Google that there's a bit of a, a bug. So I, I apologize to everyone. Normally, you see this little film strip down at the bottom, but we're not we're not getting it. So uh, I'm going to go back. So you're just going to have to hear these these voices. I will I will try to sort of switch back and forth when people are talking, but, uh, but no, this is unfortunate. Okay, back to Gary's image here. So, okay. Yeah. So, I mean, this is, you know, the full kind of, you know, uh, zoomed out view of it. And the field of view that, that Gary has here, I mean, you could fit about five full moons across there from one side to the other to give some idea of, of how big this thing looks in the sky. That, in, that entire um, that entire bright region there that's about like the, the size of the connection is like really bad for some reason. I don't understand why the connection is so damn bad. Oh, well, we'll we'll try again. We'll try again next week, Chris. Yeah, we'll do we'll do some tests over the week, and we'll we'll figure it out. So okay, so sorry to be like doing troubleshooting with people, but while I had the it on me, I could see the film strip. But then when I click back on on Gary's, it goes away. So I don't know if people can confirm that that's what they're seeing. All right. Well, I'm gonna go. Do, we're gonna go move over to, to Corey now, and uh, and see if uh, and sort of hear a report on Corey's latest uh, little trip and his uh, the images that he captured. So, Corey, what have you got? Uh, I actually got the Eagle Nebula here. I imaged here the Eagle Nebula um, two days ago. All right. Yeah. Go ahead. From my dark sky location that I went to. I had to drive about two hours away from my house and um, this is what I came up with for one of the images um, using an 80, 80 millimeter uh, APO telescope and a DSLR and this is a five minute exposure. 
Um, yeah. Unedited straight from the camera, so it's just as if I was there. This is what it looked like for me, and um, yeah, so. Is this your camera that's modified to pick up more? Uh, yes. More reds? It yeah. has the red filter taken out. Right. Okay. It's it's got the yeah the IR filter removed and replaced with a Botter um, IR UV cut filter. So. Yeah, great detail in this. So. Yeah, yeah that's and that's amazing. that's zoomed in quite a bit. My field of view is this is the full field of view of the scope. So. Um, this is so so. I apologize to be sort of trying to debug right now, but now that's back on me. I think people see the film strip, and then when I click on Corey, for example, the film strip goes away. So I I don't know what to say. <laughs> um, some people prefer it that way. They just like you know space. But uh, if you know, one can even see this, right? You can't even see me going space. I just did a hand gesture, and nobody sees it. So um, this is really this is. Enraging. Um, I must remain professional. Uh, okay, so a couple of questions here while we're sort of looking at this. Uh, Bernie Eliada asks, does the image display even larger in the infrared? So would if you you know if you could see it in infrared, would you see more more nebula? Wasn't this technically IR? I mean that's what a Hydrogen alpha is in the near infrared spectrum, well, right? Well, hydro hydrogen alpha is at a, a wavelength of 60, 656 nanometers, um, which is still technically red. The cutoff between red and infrared is 700, uh, 700 nanometers. So um, let's see. Um, so no, this, this still falls within the, the the range of red. The thing where you get more infrared radiation is if you have uh, if you have dust, if you have um, uh, if you have let's see, if you have other material extending outside of the the nebula that's cooler, um, it could possibly glow in the infrared. So, uh, answer to your question, I mean, yeah, I mean, you, you could probably see a little bit more out from the infrared. Um, but you know, it's it's not. There's you know, it, it, I'm having trouble thinking of potential cases where you see a drastically different picture in the near infrared compared with um, compared with visible light. So it's you know usually um, you know usually one traces the other pretty well because most of the stuff that that's out there that makes up any one of these is hydrogen, and hydrogen has the these lines that show up strongly at about you know 656 nanometers, about 480 nanometers, 450, 430. Um, so so visible light lines, and I guess the the most common transition in vis using visible light is that. 656 nanometers, which is um, H alpha. So yeah, so really, okay. So I guess I did answer it, but <laughs> um, yeah, you don't, you wouldn't really see that much more if you if you did um, look with infrared. So I figured out how this is happening. So whenever anyone has their, uh, they're doing a screen share, then it shows it as full screen. And when it's a person's, it's a camera on them, then they get the film strip. So change so, something. So I've yeah, so they've they've implemented some new technology. Um, okay, all right. Well, I'm gonna have to act more like a cameraman, I guess. Um, uh, so let's see. So I'm gonna move to Stuart's image now, and then maybe uh, Corey, you can cue something else up. So, so this is now Stuart's image. And this is the Ring Nebula, and um, this is full color, uh, non-modified camera. Um, cropped uh, quite significantly because the ring nebula in my field of view is pretty small, but this is a two-minute exposure at um, ISO, I think it was 800 that he took this. Um, and you can see some nice uh, um, uh, color in it. It's You can't really see the central star because it's only a two, well, maybe you can. Uh, I can in my view. Uh, it's a two-minute exposure and you see some uh, different, different colors in the various stars around it. Now, Chad, you're up. <laughs> well, actually, um, Stuart, is there any way that you can kind of zoom in a bit on it and give us a bit of a, a bigger view? There we go. Okay. There, how's that? That looks great. It's, yeah. a, it's a little fuzzy, obviously, but, you know, it's because it's cropped, uncropped. But 
um, and you're seeing now you're seeing some debaring, uh, some bearing uh, matrix noise in there. But it's still, you know, pretty good for a two minute shot. It looks terrific. Yeah. Stop, stop beating yourself up. <laughs> <laughs> So again, you get you get a little bit of red on the outside, and that's uh, hydrogen, and then the bluish, greenish blue glow in the middle is, is ionized oxygen. So what you're you're seeing is you know um, kind of the heavier elements don't move out as far. Also, they're they're kind of coming from later on in the evolution of the white dwarf in the middle's life, so they're kind of farther in. The hydrogen would have been puffed out earlier, and so that's you know much uh, much farther away from the the central star there. And of course, the star that you can see here is not actually the white dwarf at the center of this. I've been at numerous star parties where I've been like, oh yeah, I can see the white dwarf. And they're like, right, no, right, right. There's the white dwarf there in the middle. That's not it's it. Not. That's not mm -hmm. it. There's another, you know, star that's between us and the ring nebula. Uh, faint star and kind of tricks people into thinking that they can see the white dwarf. The white dwarf is oh, much fainter. It's actually um, in front of the of front of the nebula. I think so, I mean, if it was behind, it would be obscured by the, the dust and, and gas in the nebula. It would have to be, um, you know, ex exceptionally bright in order to, to get through that way. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know if anybody's done any kind of spectroscopy on it. You wouldn't be able to do parallax to measure the distance to it. If it was nearby, if it was closer to us than the nebula, there's a chance you could use parallax to measure the distance. If it's farther away, well, okay, then you've got to subtract out the, the absorption lines and emission lines from the nebula to figure out, okay, well, what's the nebula? What's coming from that star? Um, kind of a tricky problem, and then spectroscopic uh, parallax is not nearly as good as um, as geometric parallax for determining distances. So. Now, I just I just changed a setting in the cameraman uh, functionality in the Hangout, which is apparently is supposed to do the opposite of what uh, the option says it does. So I don't know if it's working yet. Um, okay, all right. Um, so we can find. I mean, I always mention this. This is my my favorite favorite object. You can you can find the Ring Nebula. You just look up, uh, you know, the three bright stars in the sky. It's the Summer Triangle. You can see um, uh, Vega right overhead, and uh, often well for me anyway in Canada. And then you can see these sort of it looks like a fish almost. And then sort of in the very end of the yeah exactly yeah that is showing yeah. us here. Why don't you do why don't you do the the shape right? So you okay, well Vega. It's a good parallelogram. I mean, there's there's Vega, and then there's a parallelogram off to the the side of Vega. It's a little bit to the east of of Vega. And if you look at the the side of the parallelogram, the short side that's farthest from Vega, the Ring Nebula is is almost dead center in between those two stars. So it's it's an easy find if you're trying to like learn how to find deep sky objects. This is a a great first one. It's got a high surface brightness, so I can see it even easily from uh, from here in LA. Um, and um, and yeah, it's so well positioned between between stars that allow you to find it that it's 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 a good one for um, if you want to try your first shot at these things that are way beyond our solar system. This is a very good first object to try for. Yeah, absolutely. It is. It is. It is just a treat. You know, even on a small telescope, you can see the this little, just a little ring, little donut. A little pop, like a little smoke ring. In yeah. The sky. yeah. 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 It's great. All right, I'm gonna move to Gary's view here. Okay. Um, we have. Uh, I don't know what it, what it is. is. Oh, hold on, hold on. Let me think. Um. The wizard. Not M17. This one. It's the swan, okay. Swan, All right. or, the Omega, or the Omega Nebula, or the Lobster Nebula. I think in the orientation right here, like, I see maybe like a one-clawed lobster. Um, but yeah, this is another bright region of hydrogen. It's, it's getting flooded with radiation from a, a very hot, new, young, massive star and um, causing the, the hydrogen to essentially fluoresce. And that's, that's what we're seeing. And I love all the little tendrils that it can have. Yeah, yeah. And how how long of an exposure is this? That's uh, one minute and no binning. That's yeah. That's amazing how much you can get on this with uh, with, with just one minute. And yeah, in fact, you know, it's it's too much here. Right, right. And it, again, this is another pretty good object to go look for because that area that's blown out, that's too bright. Um, you know, is is pretty easy to pick up in a scope visually. Though that the extra material that extends extends farther away from that, you know, you're never going to be able to see that with the naked eye. But uh, a good photograph, um, you know, brings it out really well. 
That's terrific. Um, all right. So Corey's so, got his version. Uh, of yeah, I'm going to go over to Corey's version. This is great. Corey is just, is just following along. He's taking all these same pictures. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I just heard him say, I, I had the Triffid Nebula queued up, but then he showed, uh, Gary showed the M32, and I was like, oh, well, I'll do mine. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So this was... Um, this was a five-minute exposure. You can, you can see it in the top of the file name, all the details. It's a five-minute ISO 800 um, exposure um, straight from the camera. And, yeah, I mean, you can see the detail in the, in the inside. It was kind of nice. Oh. So yeah, in processing, I can zoom in a little bit more. The, the thing is with what Gary's doing is essentially kind of just taking it straight from the scope and, and giving us an image we can see. With processing, you can say, okay, don't bring up the, the center region quite as much. All right, let's mm -hmm. go in and bring up the, the levels in... Uh, oh, this is, a, this is unprocessed. Levels. This is completely unprocessed. Yeah, these are, you're right. You, he, he warned me. I'm sorry, I didn't, should have told you guys. He warned Seriously? me. He's like, these are going to be my yeah, unprocessed no, images. So Yeah, these, yeah. Are, these are raw. These are raw straight off the camera. Um, I haven't had time to do anything with them because okay. I was out. I was out for two nights in a row, and I've got 100 minutes total of all the of all the targets that I shot including this one and this That's is one one exposure that hasn't been stacked or anything so no That's, no adjustments so okay that's I'm 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 kind of dumbfounded now. That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're, I mean, the, this tells you want, you can have the data and you can play with it if you want but yeah, yeah I, I, I the, mean if there's other astronomers joining us, uh, you know, the astronomers will often do this. They'll share their, their raw data over on either the space community or the uh, photography community, astrophotography community, and then just, you know, take turns processing each other's photographs to sort of see what they can, they can pull out of it. There's some great tutorials if you kind of dig back into the catalog of, of, uh, in the communities of, of sort of how to do some of the processing that the astronomers do. So that is really cool. Yeah. Yeah. So and then to show the field of view of my scope is there's the whole image right there. So one thing that really stands out with this nebula too are the idea of dark nebulae that you you have regions where the hydrogen's getting hit with this you know in, incredibly intense ultraviolet radiation, but then you have re regions where the amount of gas and dust is so dense it just blocks the field of view of everything around it. And then kind of near the, the neck of the swan or in between the claw of the lobster up here, you have this one of the darkest dark nebulae regions I think I've ever, you know, I've, I've seen in the, in the sky. Um, you know, kind of over to the right there. Um, you know, if you one thing you can do is kind of check what you know what values go with a, a certain pixel with what, what amount of light. This is, um, yeah, this is just ri ridiculously dark in there. So, very dense, good, good star formation region. All right, I'm going to move over to Stuart's view again, and I apologize again for the. Weirdness. Um, okay, so I've got a couple of questions here too. Uh, let's see. Uh, BTL seven forty three wants to know what does binning what does binning mean? So, so so binning is essentially if you if you look at kind of a raw photograph, then each pixel represents how much light has fallen on that pixel. What binning does is say, okay, no, we're gonna we're gonna take a square of two pixels by two pixels and combine all of the light into there into just one pixel. Or we can do it three by three. We can do three by three, you know, three pixel by three pixel squares. So what it allows you to do is take much shorter exposures, but they don't quite have as much detail. Um, so I mean they're very good it's a very good practice for people with really large fields of view and then here for the virtual star party where we're trying to get images out quickly um, because yeah it, it 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 allows for much faster gathering of light you know two by two binning lets you gather an image four times faster three by three binning lets you gather an image nine times faster so abs that that made total sense. Um, oh, and Kevin Franklin says that apparently that central star in the Helix Nebula, it's the same deal, that it's, that it's the, uh, you know, that it's not really there. It's faking us out. Yeah, exactly. And speaking of, what have we got, Stuart? Uh, this is the Dumbbell Nebula. Oh, the Dumbbell Nebula. Oh. I see a central star. Yeah, <laughs> and um, this, this nebula has always been one of my favorites because it just has a 
a ton of color in it. Um, this was a three minute exposure at ISO 400. Um, and uh, you're not, it's uh, the very outside edges of it are um, supposed to be a little redder, but since my camera's non modified, it, you, know, you don't quite see it, but you can see the blue in it uh, really nicely. And yeah, I think here we do get the the central star. I mean, the images of this that I've shot, you know, you can see kind of a, a yellowish or reddish tinge to most of the stars around there, but the one in the center glows a very, you know, white or blue white, and that's characteristic of the the heat of a of a white dwarf star that's left over when um, you know st a star like our sun reaches the end of its life. Um, but again, here the blue is uh, blue greenish bluish green color around the the center. There is ionized oxygen. So, you know, a uh, much heavier element produced kind of at the, the end of a, of a star's life. Um, and then we've got, uh, what's cool is Corey has uh, got his version of it as well. Again, yeah. raw, Corey? <laughs> yeah, this is raw. I, uh, I didn't even actually image this one at the dark sky for real. This is just one exposure I took to see what the difference was between my home imaging uh, location and the dark sky. And... Um, it's actually such a bright object, I didn't bother doing it at, um, in the dark skies. I just decided to stick and do it at home. But um, this is a single five-minute um, exposure. Yeah, raw. So uh, Wayne W. says, try the Saturn Nebula for colors. So can you see this? Is the Saturn Nebula up right now? No, I think it's in Aquarius, and so you would need to get up at some you know, yeah. you need to be out imaging at about 2 a.m. I think to to be able to have a shot at it. And then uh, Chris, that's, that's early for Corey. And then Chris Elliott has a view of it as well. Um, but this is not live, Chris. No, it's not. Yeah. yeah. Oh, we're that getting was some, taken. Yeah, that was taken at Cherry you. Springs back in May. Yeah, we're getting some echo from you, so you need to put some headphones on. I'm gonna have to mute you. Okay, not a problem. Uh. Okay, I'm going to go to Gary's view. Uh, this is... Oh, right. This is the Borg Nebula. Yes, that's it. <laughs> you got it. Uh, M8, this is the Lagoon. The Lagoon Nebula, yeah. I tried to get this last week, but it hadn't quite cleared the trees yet. But uh, I love the little, as Slarty Bartfast would say, the fiddly bits in this one. <laughs> Yeah, especially, I mean, you know, you get these these tendrils of the hydrogen gas, but even a little bit toward the, the lower right corner of, of your frame right now, that, that dark little knot there, that's a star forming in there. Mm, that, neat. That, that tight little knot in there, that, that is where, um, that's where a star is forming. And again, this is another, you know, pretty good um, object to look for if you're just trying to figure out, you know, look how to look for deep. Uh, deep sky images. If you look at the constellation Sagittarius as a teapot, this is just above the spout of the teapot. It's kind of, you know, if you imagine uh, the Milky Way as steam kind of rising out of the teapot, this is a very bright knot in that steam. If you turn a telescope or binoculars to it, this is what you will see. Just really, can you zoom back out again, Gary? It really just looks like, like the Borg or like, I don't know. Homer Simpson, like well, yeah, a, like a is, is the chimpanzee, mouth, um, the nose, and yeah, a Homer right. Simpson forehead, yeah. And this, I mean, this That's is kind I'm of thinking. rotated ninety degrees from how most people usually show it. But I mean, yeah, it's amazing the pareidolia you can get out with uh, <laughs> with this kind of thing here. So, other um, interesting little factoid about this: that this nebula is almost exactly where the sun is on the winter solstice on December twenty first. This, this nebula lies very close to, happens to lie very close to the ecliptic. And so the sun is practically just right here on, uh, on December 21st. But much closer. Uh, good, yeah. <laughs> give, give it a couple thousand light years closer to the, to the sun rather than to uh, the Lagoon Nebula. And Corey, have you got one as well? No, you've got the... I, I have a Lagoon, from a, the lagoon. from a couple of weeks ago. Um, I'm not seeing it. I'm not seeing the no, same thing. No, this, this is the Trifid. That's this the Trifid, yeah, yeah. Yeah, this is an M8. Um, I can pull up a Lagoon from a couple of weeks ago if you'd like to sure. compare. So I'll find that quick. Sure, and I'm going to move over to Stuart's view because I'm seeing he's got something new. Yeah, this is um, uh, 
called the Double Double, and uh, this is quite zoomed in. It's Epsilon Lyra, and it's kind of near the ring. Actually, not kind of near. It's very near the ring nebula, and it's kind of just on the opposite side of it. And if you look at it under very small magnification, the it just looks like a double star, but if you zoom it in, you see these two double stars, and so that's why they call it the double double. And I absolutely love this because it's one of my favorites for star parties, and um, it's it just so delicate and very cute. And again, there's all these neat little geometric forms in Lyra. Like I said, there's the parallelogram, and the ring is between you know to the two stars on one of the short sides of the parallelogram. If you go in the other direction, you get Vega as part of a, a close to equilateral triangle, and Epsilon Lyrae is is one of the other vertices of that that equilateral triangle in the uh, the other part of Lyra. So that's great. Now, Corey, don't tell me you've also got this queued up for us. <sighs> no, I think he's got oh, his. Wow. Yeah, he's got his view of the of the lagoon. So it's the lagoon plus the Trifid Nebula. I mean, this is an enormous yeah. field of view, able to get to get both of these things wow. out here. So and showing, you know, kind of how how close together they are in the sky. Not not at all close together in space, but <laughs> um, but in the sky they kind of sit kind of right on right on top of each other. So the lagoon nebula is to the the south. Um, the Trifid Nebula is to the the north, but again, all all fairly close together in the sky, uh, close enough for Corey with his enormous field of view there with this setup to be able to get both of them together. So, very nice. That's fantastic. Nice work. It's interesting that I can get like such a good image out of an eighty millimeter aperture. It's not, you know, it's just, it's relatively slow, isn't it? <clears throat> Excuse me. Did give some idea. Seven point five. So to give some idea what Corey's talking about, I mean, this this is like the bottom of a of a DVD case. The opening to his telescope is smaller than this, and he's able to get these kind of images with it. Yeah. So you know, it's it's not always all about you know the bigger the bigger the scope, the the better the image. I mean, if you if you right. have good tracking and if you have the the right photo equipment, um, and good dark skies. I mean, dark skies make such a huge difference because I mean, I, I, <clears throat> this was from home actually. So this wasn't in. This is in a like a bordel orange, yellow border. Uh, but you did get a chance to process it, right? No, this is a raw. Another raw image. Oh, yeah. God. Yeah. So I mean, you get some idea of the 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 background, but still, you know, that that whole bordel yellow or orange. So I mean, there's a scale for how much light pollution interference you have. If you're where I am in Long Beach, it's white. It means you are not going to see any deep sky objects. Um, it goes from white to red, to orange, to yellow. I usually image from like an orange or yellow area, and you can see the Milky Way. You can you can see stars down to about you know magnitude five and a half, close to six. Um, but when you go to process your images, there's this strong background to them. Uh, green, you know, the edges of like um, Joshua Tree are kind of green. You get deep into Joshua Tree. It's dark. It's blue. And then the 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 absolute faintest um, background light on the Bortle scale is there's dark gray and then there's black. Um, I've only ever been to two black sky sites in my life, Death Valley and then and then in, in Botswana. And um, it's it's crazy some of the stuff that just hides from you that then comes out in plain view when the sky is that dark. Zodiacal light is like a spotlight if you're under some place that is that oh, wow. dark and has that little interference from um, from man made light. So you know there's Yeah huge... I can go ahead sorry. I, I haven't been to the I haven't been to the desert, you know, but uh, I was at a black sky site which is Luckily, only two hours from my house, and it's the only place, like I don't know, in the central U.S. that I've seen that's still black, um, according to the light pollution map that I've seen. And I don't know, it was incredible, even in the northern hemisphere, you know, to see that. Yeah, yeah I'm really lucky. I've got. Uh, I'm actually headed headed tomorrow, actually, to my childhood home, which is Hornby Island. It's this little uh, Gulf island off the coast of Vancouver Island. And I'll be there taking the kids there, and and it's just pristine black dark skies. It's a just unbelievable. So I'll take. I'm going to take all my gear and try and do some uh, some. I, I'm going to take that 14 millimeter quarry. So I'm going to take some uh, nice dark sky Milky Way stuff. So good. You'll yeah. be proud of me. Sounds good. Focus. Focus hard. Spend focus. a lot of time focusing. Yeah. Seriously. I will. <laughs> well, because I mean, it's it's all manual, right? So. Yes. Yeah. Totally. 
So, but yeah, I mean, if you're on the East Coast, I'm not even sure where you can get to uh, a Bortle Black Sky site. I mean, maybe um, I think Mike Rector is in Northern New York. There might be something of that that nature around there. But really, I mean, you you've got to be out west or or in the the central part of the country. And out west, I don't mean where I am, because I mean, you know, I'm I'm in this megalopolis of 12 million people. Where forget it, right? You're not going to be able to see anything. But if I drive out to the Mojave Desert, I can get to a black sky site in about three hours. Um, so, uh, so at some point this this summer, I'll have to get out there and do some some more imaging. Uh, and I, we always remind people uh, set something up for the Perseids. It's you know mm. it's only a month away ish, and uh, you know take a couple of take a couple of days and go out and enjoy the Perseids. Camp out with your friends and your family and it's such a great time. And people always ask, what should I do to bring, you know, what should I bring to watch a meteor shower? Bring a lawn chair. <laughs> bring a lawn chair, yeah. Bring a yeah, chaise exactly. lounge, bring a blanket to put on the ground. and just A warm back. drink. Yep, and just something where you can just stare up and look to see as much of the sky at once as possible. That's, that's how you watch a meteor shower. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so Stuart has put up uh, M51. Correct. This is M51. It's, um, this was a two-minute... I believe, um, uh, slightly stretched in in Photoshop, just to sort of bring out a little bit of the um, uh, a little bit of the color and with a noise reduction filter put in. Um, but you can see some of the the nice um, spirals in that. Can you embiggen it? Uh, indeed. Now we're cooking. How's that? Now nah, I like that. That I like. Uh, Tom Tom Nath says you guys need to come out here to Central Oregon, so he's invited us to visit him. Done. Uh, when when can we come, Tom? We'll be there shortly. Um, actually, you know we're going to need to come to your house for the uh, for the solar eclipse. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Or not his house because I think he's he's west of the Cascades, but it you know it's getting out east of the Cascades where you really want to be for the eclipse. Well, well Central we'll just... Oregon is is east of the Cas Cascades, right? Yeah, that's that's true. Yeah. Um, <laughs> BTL743 says, I'm sorry when I hear Joshua Tree, I think of you too. The cover photo for that was actually not shot in Joshua Tree. I've been to the, the Joshua Tree. Well, it's on the ground now. It's dead and fallen over. Sorry, you two fans. Um, but it is not actually in Joshua Tree National Park. We got a request for Alberio in color. Oh, Stuart, is it Alberio? On it. All right. <laughs> Stuart, that's like one of Stuart's favorites. You don't have to really ask him twice to go and bring that up. Um, M51, interacting galaxy, little satellite galaxy going on there. Yeah, so I mean there's, um, so it's it's M51 and NGC 5195 is the, the kind of, you know, brighter nucleus galaxy that's off to the, the right there and kind of pulling a streamer of material off of the, the main spiral galaxy. This also shows up in the ARP catalog. The ARP catalog is a catalog of, of peculiar and interacting galaxies. And so this uh, object, because there is the interaction between the two galaxies, shows up in that catalog as well. Uh, Ronald Minch says, uh, leave your children more room for gear if you're going to go see a, a, a meteor shower. <laughs> um, well, yes, that is true, technically, more room for gear. Uh, but the kids often enjoy it, so, you know. Who, who are we to leave them behind? Um, that's great. I'm going to move to Gary's view. He's been yeah, Everybody was doing uh, M27 just as I was shooting this one, so I thought I'd bring it up. This is uh, M27 and hydrogen alpha. Again, a, a one minute at no binning. I like your no binning. <laughs> it depends on what I'm looking at. Yeah, I guess so. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I've got another one queued up. So. Oh, great. Okay, all right. Um, and I got M101. Do you now? Okay, all right. Well, I'm going to see what Chris has brought up. So Chris has got Alberio, but this isn't live, Chris, is it? Right. It's cloudy skies here, so I don't have anything. I just have pictures from the last month. There you go. So that was taken... Uh, yeah, so so just to be clear, this is the first time joining us, so just to be clear, we, uh, we try to avoid the, you know, the astrophotos, but... You know, we try to make a real distinction between what's live. This is great, though, because your image has got, like, this big when it was taken, and that is not today. So right. we're, we're all right. 
But if I was uh, out, yeah, if it wasn't as cloudy, I definitely would be outside taking some live shots. But it's not nice here in New York. <laughs> <laughs> and and so like, where is your nearest dark skies in New York? We were just talking the, about this. The nearest from here is about three hours out in Cherry Springs, Pennsylvania. It's near Cowdersport. And, and that's it, where and that's gray. That's not black, but it's gray on the Bortle scale. So you can see uh, the Milky Way there. Correct. Yeah. So, like, my backyard is probably what you guys would consider to be gray. And yeah. then, although I think it's yellow. You know that dark sky, you know, Clear tool? dark sky? Yeah. yeah. So, so I'm in a, a yellow zone, and then five minutes away from me, it's dark. Yeah, I think, I think where I grew up technically would have been maybe orange, and I could see the, the Milky Way in the summer from, uh, from my house. I grew up, um, you know, about 10 or 15 miles um, north of, of Bethlehem and Allentown. Pennsylvania, um, but yeah, Cowdersport out there, and you know, there's central Pennsylvania. There's there's like Philly and Allentown and Scranton on the east, and Pittsburgh and Erie on the west, and like nothing in <laughs> the middle of, of northern Pennsylvania there. So yeah, a lot of a uh, lot of good dark skies in, um, in in central PA. All right, well, I'll move to Stewart's view here before before he brings us the Alberio, but. Uh... And what was that? M. This is M101. 101, yeah. And um, it's a face on Spiral Galaxy. Um, actually, this is the first time I've ever imaged it, which is kind of cool. Hmm. Um, oh, okay. And... It always looks so lopsided to me. Yeah, I mean, the arms do stretch out much farther on, on one side than the other. There's a much thicker, um, you know, portion of the, the disc of the, the spiral structure on, on one side than than the other. But that one arm that sticks off to the, the top of this view, you can see some emission nebulae in that arm. There's some little bright knots in that part of the picture. And that would be like if you were looking at our galaxy from the outside and you could see like the lagoon nebula or, or something like that, um, you know, or, or the, the Swan Nebula, the, um, the Eagle Nebula, what you're seeing when you look at M101 and you see that um, those little knots in the upper portion of that, that spiral arm, those are emission nebulae that we can see from here um, about 20 million light years away. Great. All right, I'm going to move to Gary's view. This is the Crescent Nebula in uh, Cygnus. Oh, that's great. So, so this is what's called a wolf array star. So the, the star in the middle there is enormously huge, enormously bright, enormously luminous. When it dies, it will become a supernova. But there's a, there's a lower limit for how big something has to be to start nuclear fusion. There's also an upper limit to how big a star can be. If it's above that upper limit, it becomes unstable and starts puffing out its outer layers. And so that's what's happened here, is that, that kind of crescent of gas that's off of this thing is the outer layers of this star that have been blasted off into space because the thing produces too much energy too quickly. And so it's kind of puffed out its, its outer layers and is now illuminating them. And uh, you know, so when this thing does finally, when it does die, you'll you'll see an extra star in uh, in Cygnus the Swan that glows much brighter than than anything else uh, around there. But for now, I mean, just extremely hot, bright star in the middle, and it's it's so enormous that it's puffed off its outer layers to to view here as the Crescent Nebula. Uh, Tom just said thanks for the Alberio shot, but Tom, we're not done with you yet here. Uh, so here's Stuart's view. Yep. This is a 15 second shot. I kept it really short because I found that with Albura, if I go much longer than that, I, <coughs> excuse me, I lose some of the color. But um, you can, so that's why it's so black and there's not a lot of detail, but you can clearly see the, the blue and gold yeah. um, on it. Well, so I'm gonna I'm just gonna switch quickly over to Corey's view because he's got it as well, and he let them. And I think his view shows exactly what you're talking about. So you can see in his picture, you know, you've lost that color, but you know, and they're a lot brighter now, and you're you're getting those spikes, right? Yeah, this is um from last week's star party actually. So, um, I uh, I made a diffraction spike mask, if you want to call it that, uh, for my refractor, specifically for star targets like this. And it's just two pieces of wire making a crosshair across the objective of the lens and so that I can get diffraction spikes if I want them for art purposes. Oh, so, uh, art purposes. Right. Um, and so I shot Alberio just for fun because it's a nice one. And you can see the color 
if you look at around the... Um, you know, I can the, see some little diffraction spikes around some of the other stars in the image, too. Like, if right. you look over on your on the left-hand side, you have some dimmer stars, and you're still getting some spikes there. Right, right. So, and then some of the color shows in, in, in this pair yeah. still does show in the diffraction spikes themselves, um, I've noticed, so... I'm going to go back to Stuart's view here and see the... And so this, this, you know, this kind of washing out of color is kind of a limitation of the way cameras work. You, you have a, an array of pixels. Essentially, when light hits a pixel, it will register with an, sending out an electron that gets stored at the edge of the array. And then some other uh, process comes by and sweeps through and says, okay, well, I collected this many electrons from this pixel and this many from this pixel. And so the thing is, as you hit it with more light, then the number of electrons just fills up until it gets to a maximum value. Well, if you get the maximum maximum value in red, in green, and blue, the whole thing just looks white at that point. So, you know, this is what's going on with the, the, the colors if you just expose for too long, is that you fill up the, the red, green, and blue bins entirely. At, at that point, you know, you've, you've just created something that has, uh, that's just white. Now, now the way it looks in this image, though, I mean, you know, one, is it, a, is it an actual binary star? We don't know. Nobody knows. Nobody no, knows. <laughs> if, if it is, they have an enormous orbital period, like greater than, um, I think I've seen some estimates putting it at about 100,000 years for an orbital period. Um, or they could be what's called a visual double, where it just happens to be two stars and one is closer than the other. But because they lie along a line, they look like they're together in the sky, even though one is, is much farther away than the, uh, the other one. So, yeah, so the, the jury is out on this one. Um, you know, I guess if we can watch it for a couple more hundred years, then then we'll know for sure. And also in this uh, in this image, it, you know, it looks like we're seeing like the big disks of the star, but we're not seeing the disks of the star. They're just points. No, they're, no. they're points, and it, it kind of bleeds out into the other pixels. And yeah, the other thing is, oh, sorry, I'm sorry. This is just because it's because it's cropped and zoomed, and um, it, exactly. So it's it's there. It's they're not. It's not supposed to be like this. But with bright stars, this is just what happens. In it looks great. I think it looks super cool. So I think you know, don't worry about it. Don't beat yourself up so much. Not, not no, 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 no self beating over here. No. All right, no, no <laughs> flagellation. Okay, all right. I'm gonna go to uh, to Gary's view. And if you don't know what this is, you're fired. <laughs> it's the pinwheel. <laughs> no. The propeller. The propeller. There you all go. Right. All right, right. The pinwheel galaxy and the propeller nebula. No, right. There we go. All right, I'm fired. And we've had yeah, both of them tonight, it. right? That M101 is the pinwheel, and yeah. so now we have the propeller. So nice knots of uh, of dark nebulae in, in this emission region too. So it really helps define the kind of propeller shape with the where the the dark molecular clouds overlay, where the um, the bright emission nebula is. And and so is it a star forming region as well? Yes. Okay. So and is it just a complete fluke that it's got this shape? Again, I mean, there's there's so many processes that go on inside one of these nebulae as to when where stars are born, where they where they die, you know, where it gets cooler and denser, and you get dark nebulae, or where it stays, you know, lighter uh, or less dense, and you hit it with this this high intensity radiation from an, an O class star and get it to glow brightly like this, and uh, again, trying trying to rewind it. I mean, what we have here is a snapshot looking at one instant in, instance in time of something that's evolved over millions of years. So, you know, to, to try and piece it back together again, yeah, maybe if we can keep, keep taking photos over the next thousand years, 10,000 years, you know, then, then we might be able to get some idea of, of how to run the, the picture backwards. There are objects that expand quickly enough that you can kind of do this a little bit with, like the Crab Nebula, which would be, you know, a prominent winter object. Um, it's a supernova that exploded that was visible to us about 950 years ago. Um, and so if you photograph it like 20 years ago and compare it with the photograph for now, you can see that it's changed shape and it's, it's changed size over that time um, due to its expansion. But, you know, something, something like this, you know, it's a much slower to evolve. So, it, you know, it's going to take a, a lot longer to, to see any kind of changes. So. Um, okay, I'm going to move to Corey's photograph, not live view, photograph. Raw. Uh, again. Raw, again. Yeah. From the dark sky location. This is the veil, one half of the veil nebula. 
Um, the veil, you must be the veil must be getting pretty low though, right? Uh, I was out. Up. It's coming. I was up. out all yeah. night for two nights in a row, so I got pretty much everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, the veil's a late summer object anyway. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's it's in the eastern part of Cygnus, so. Um, how, how does I know there's the eastern veil and the western veil, but I don't remember which one is which. Which this is the one on the left. If you look at, and I don't know. Left, <laughs> left, left is eastern. Yeah, left would be eastern. This okay. Is, what you're showing is the eastern one, yeah. Okay. Thank you. I have I have both of them. So. But yeah, speaking of supernova remnants, I mean the veil is a supernova remnant. So a star that died and exploded, and then just kind of thrust all this material out away from it. Um, this is some portion of that explosion where it's a little bit thicker, and so you can just kind of see this this veil. And I guess this is the western version that Corey's showing now, the western yeah, version I, of it. Yeah, I named wrong, so sorry so. about that. Um, but yeah, I really liked on this one, even um, image I could see. It yeah, I'm not sure if people can see it over on the right hand side. It looks in. yeah, it looks you can so see, like, wispy. The braid and stuff. Uh, yeah. yeah. Like a braid to me, mm -hmm. and even in the, it's one one exposure raw to the camera. I kind of fell out of my chair when I saw that, <laughs> and didn't stop the camera until I absolutely had to. So. Wow! But this is a five minute um, ISO eight hundred exposure. Oh, that's terrific. Um, okay, I'm gonna move to uh, let's see, let's see what Chris is showing us here. So he's showing us uh, what what object is this? That's the ring nebula. Right. Okay, I see. And then you've yeah. got different different darkness of skies. Correct. Now, what we were talking about the Bortle scale. The left one is from North Tonawanda, from where I am, and the one on the right is from Cherry Springs. And you can see the difference in the darkness from the ISO. Oh yeah. Yeah, you, I mean you're you're able to drag out so much more detail if you're shooting from someplace dark that you know it's. Otherwise, it gets kind of lost and washed away in the light pollution. But, you know, I, when I was shooting for Death Valley, I guess that was over two years ago now, um, it's an un unbelievable amount of detail and almost, you know, very little processing to subtract out background at all. I mean, I think, in fact, I, I think I told the nebulosity, okay, go ahead and subtract the background. It didn't do anything <laughs> because, you know, it, it's just so dark out there. So. All right, I'm going to go to Gary's view. This is the Gamma Cygn Nebula. Yeah. It's almost dead center of the Northern Cross in Cygnus. You are having crazy good viewing tonight, Gary. Uh, yeah. Yeah, clear skies. What is going on? Is it, is it not everything not on fire there right now? <laughs> no fire. The moon isn't up. Yeah, yeah. Your, your seeing is really clear tonight. So, yeah. Fire season doesn't, I mean, I think, well, there has been some fire season already, but it usually doesn't kick in hard until September. It's yeah. when, uh, when everything, you know, uh, whatever rains we got over the winter caused stuff to grow, it's all dead by September, and then once it catches, yeah, just everything kind of smells like smoke around here for about two months. <laughs> yeah, no, it happens here, too, even. Although we've had a really wet spring, so when we've had, uh, you know, normally I stop cutting my grass by now, but it's still growing like crazy, like a weed. Hmm. So yeah, yeah, we're, it's been a very strange spring. But you know, how do you like your how do you like your climate change? <laughs> uh, right, no, it's a hoax. It's not changing. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's that's just gorgeous. Wow. And I mean, and you wouldn't see any of this with your. Like none of this with a small telescope, even. I mean, you really need the this camera. Re this requires photography. Yeah. yeah. Even even from the darkest skies, you don't really see the butterfly nebula or the this complex around uh, around Gamma Cygni. Um, but you know, again, just this rich, rich area of um, of star formation. And uh, well, actually, yeah, I'm not even sure how much of this. Uh, would be star formation. The darker knots in it would be places where, um, where where stars might be forming. But like from here in at our latitude, Los Angeles is 34 degrees north. This passes pretty much directly overhead. It passes within five degrees of directly overhead from here. So it, it's not there now, but uh, by about 1 a.m. tonight, um, one between 1 and 2 a.m. it would be. So. All right, I'm gonna go to Stuart's view and just you know we're starting to run out of time, so. Yeah. 
Um, just um, like one more image each, and then we'll we'll wrap this up. Uh, this just, was actually this was actually a mistake. I didn't mean to do this one. Um, <laughs> I actually I, I I put in the wrong number on my on my thing. I meant to do M11, and I got M17. I went, wait a second, M M11 isn't a, a nebula, and I looked it up, and, <laughs> and this is a Swan Nebula in color. Um, this is a, a three minute uh, exposure. And um, I, this is some also something I've never imaged before, so um, uh, it's kind of cool for me. It's a very pretty mistake. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I would. I mean, this it would be great for you to like take that one back and do some processing on it and see what you can pull out of it. Um, yeah, it's. I'd have to. I have to obviously do more and to stack it. And, but but yeah, you're right. Yeah, I'd, I'd say put that one on the menu. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. All right, and then Corey. Now Corey's just gone way back into his uh, archive. This, this, Hi. you didn't get this from this last, uh, this last weekend, did you? Uh, this is this is from the past by about forty-eight hours. Um, this is on July fourth. Um, I saw this. Yeah. I saw M thirty-one start to pop up, and the skies were, I mean, horizon to horizon almost were dark. So I swung swung the scope over after I was done imaging everything else, and just thought I'd get as much as I could, and. Uh, I actually got ended up getting 45 minutes of good data on M31 before dawn started. Oh yeah, so it was a total morning object. It was, yeah. It was. Uh, I don't know. I think I started about 3:30 in the morning and kept it going until until it started to turn blue. So but it turned true. out really good. I thought um, this is a five-minute exposure. Yeah. Uh, Corey told me that he's planning on on assassinating uh, M31 later in the season. And this is just something he just wants to absolutely kill. <laughs> well, yeah, well, we can... I will. Uh, yeah, destroy <laughs> You're gonna add it. You're gonna have like a head on your on your yeah. on your wall. Yeah, it's I mean, supposed his, to be his, hard, but you know, I'm I'm gonna make sure that his it, his it field of view is is perfect for it, though. I mean, yeah, it's it really this, is. He has yeah. absolutely the perfect scope for it. It's even a bigger field of view than Gary's. Now, I mean, not much, but like a little bit bigger of a field of view. I want this scope. You know how I used to want your scope, Stuart? I don't. <laughs> I want. <laughs> no. His is cheaper. I know. Yeah, I know. So that's a that's lot. a big reason why I want his scope. You can get two, you know, just in case. I know, I know, I get two for the price of Stuart Scope. Um, although that mount, I know you dropped some money on that mount. Uh, I love the mount. Yeah, yeah. yeah every, everything goes in the mount. The mount's more important than the scope. All right, well, I'm going to look, I'm going to sort of show off what Gary's got here, and then I think we'll start to wrap this up. So, Gary, what is this? This is a piece of the veil. Uh, I think this would be the Western. Um, yes. Yep. Yeah, I show the veil, I show the Cirrus Nebula northwest part, and then the Cirrus Nebula east. So yeah, this is this is the west section. That's great. And Bill McLaughlin is watching, so I'm going to say hi to Bill. He wasn't able to join us tonight, but because um, it's just too bright. So Fraser, I just wanted to bring up something that I was shooting earlier today. Oh yeah. And the uh, the sun, the southern hemisphere of the sun's kind oh. of going crazy right now. Wow. And so this wow. is uh, it's called Active Region 1785, and uh, I mean this the Earth could fit from from end to end of this thing. You could fit about six or seven Earths from one end of this sunspot group to the other. I mean the Earth is about it's it's smaller than the size of that largest spot over to the the right edge of this. So yeah, so I was imaging this from my driveway um, earlier today. Uh, we got the request. Wayne wants to know the telescopes that are being used. So uh, why don't we sort of, as we wrap this up, let's sort of have everyone give us the rundown of what their scope is. So I'm going to start with Chris. So Chris, what is the telescope that uh, that you're using? I'm using a six-inch Celestron uh, reflector. There you go. Uh, and thanks for and thanks for joining us, Chris. We'll we'll Thank get you. you more technically up to speed for next week. Yeah. Uh, uh, Corey, what have you? Oh, this is awesome. Uh, so what uh, what's your scope? It's the eighty. Um, I'm using an eighty millimeter um, APO ED whatever ED APO. Not, I don't think it's a true APO. I think it's um, kind of a fake one, but um, it's a ED glass. It's really it's a nice glass for the price. Um, it's a Vixen ED eighty. Uh, telescope. It's the same exact thing as uh, the Orion ED80, so they're all the same glass, just rebranded. Um, inexpensive, good, 
you're, and this you're image that you're us. that you're sharing, this is uh, this is your setup. Yeah, this was the, this was the setup from the Fourth of July. Um, this is a single. Oh, what was this? I think it's a twenty-five second exposure. And um, is this I'll with the uh, with the fourteen that we share? Yes. Yes. Yeah. This was with the fourteen, and so that's my little my little tent that keeps the wind the wind out and. Uh, if there's any cars that want to drive by and ruin any exposures, it keeps those headlights on as well. That's that's good thinking, which they will. Uh, they will. Gary, uh, this is your beautiful telescope. Yep, it is uh, the Celestron 14 um, Schmidt Cassegrain. And the scope goes from about here to here, and then this front part's a dew shield, and the camera's sitting right inside this shield here. And then this is my guide scope when I take long exposures. That keeps me on what I want to be on, but that's a live view right now, and that's pointed right there at the uh, the uh, Veil Nebula. That's great. Uh, Stuart's cam, Stuart's telescope. It's I'm trying to remember. It's a 130. Well, it's a 140. It's 140. 140. Yeah, 140. Yeah, 140 Apo uh, yep. Telescope Engineering Corporation. Um, uh, they're it's kind of their bread and butter, most popular uh, scope. And um, uh, that's it's just basically a bigger version of what um, Corey, yeah. Corey has. Yeah. Awesome. All right. And thanks for joining us. And uh, Thad, yours is a 9.5 inch, right? Nine and a quarter. Yeah. Nine and a quarter, yeah. Celestron Edge HD. So the one thing I've, I've found that's really nice is a lot of times I'll shoot um, Hyperstar with it, which means I take out the secondary. Um, putting the secondary back in, I've probably done this 40 or 50 times by now, it's still collimated. Nice. So, yeah, it's w very well-designed scope there from uh, from Celestron. Oh, great. So. And they and Celestron didn't pay you for that uh for that advertisement. In I'm fact, you paid I'm them. Happy in, I'm happy <laughs> enough with it that, yeah, I'll, I'll just I'll, I'll give them props. So. All right. Uh, okay, cool. Well, thanks everyone for joining us. Um, really appreciate it. And sorry for the technical problems we're having. Uh, this was keeping me a little, uh, a little distracted for this uh, episode of the Virtual Star Party. Uh, but if you enjoyed uh, this, I highly recommend you click subscribe somewhere. If you're watching this over on YouTube, click on subscribe, and that way you'll get notifications when we do other stuff, other live events and things like that. So... Um, yeah, click on subscribe on YouTube, and if you haven't already, circled the Virtual Star Party. And if you, like, if you click on that, yes, you've attended this event over on Google Plus, uh, on the event page, then when we recreate the event, you'll get invited to the next one. So each week you just keep getting re-invited to these star parties, and it's we get a lot of people want to know like, how can I find out when the thing's going to happen? You want to get invited to these events, and that way, each week you just get the you get the invite. So, so give that a try. Um, so now we're sort of on hiatus for a lot of stuff that we're doing over the summer. I know Pamela is traveling in uh, in Europe right now, and so we're not going to be you know that's it for Astronomy Cast until uh, September. Uh, I think we'll keep doing the virtual star parties while we've got energy for it, and hopefully we'll start going earlier nights again now that the now that the stupid Earth tilt is moving in our favor again, and we're not going to be so late for the folks on the on the East Coast, but because I know it's like what one in the morning right now, one thirty. Yeah, yeah, one thirty-three. Yeah, the fact that you're watching this, I I am really impressed that you like astronomy that much. Um, so thanks everyone for watching, and uh, we will see you all for the next event. All right, thanks everyone, and thanks for participating, everyone, and welcome aboard, Chris. It was great to have Thank you join you. us. Thank you. All right. See you, see you later, everybody. Bye. Have a good, good night. night, everybody.